Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Uwe Heuser. I'm the green editor of Die Zeit. And it's my pleasure this morning to talk to Stefano Boeri, um, architect and professor of architecture from Milan, also a well-reputed author um, and famous for his vertical forests, um, buildings that have lots of trees and plants um, all over them and um, high rises mostly. Um, and um, uh, we talk about that and we talk about the general idea of developing a sustainable city this morning. Very much looking forward to this. Welcome, Signora Boeri. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to see you and meet you. Excellent. Um, Signor Boe, um, preparing for this, I couldn't help noticing um, that you had some parental influences. Your mother has been in design, I saw, and your father in neurology. Have this indeed been early influences on, on you and what you're doing? Yes, for sure. It's always <clears throat> complicated to decipher the way and the moment in which you are influenced by, by your parents, uh, but, but for sure, uh, I, I, I believe it's happened. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I had never, never worked with my mother, uh, but she was uh, uh, always present uh, with uh, her amazing, uh, let's say, elegance and the capacity to decline uh, uh, the furniture design in such a, let's say, minimalistic and at the same time, extremely efficient way. And about my father, I think that well, there was something about the relation between, uh, let's say, um, the uh, psychological and uh, physiological uh, uh, sphere uh, that we, we, we share. So it's uh, th this uh, idea that uh, uh, the physiological synapses are also conditioned by by some uh, uh, totally immaterial connection was uh, probably, uh, let's say, extremely uh, inspirational for, for my work as an urbanist. So I think that we and we observe a, a, an urban environment, we have always to consider uh, the two spheres, the material one and the material one, how, uh, let's say, for instance, the collective imaginary is conditioning the transformation of urban environments and, and, and the reciprocity between the two. So I, I think that uh, these uh, uh, two spheres were uh, in a certain way inspired also by, by my, my parents' thoughts. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Um, so with this in mind, how should we in general go about thinking about developing a sustainable city? Well, it's, um, I think something that, uh, that we have to do now, we, we do now uh, uh, in quite a different way uh, in relation to what uh, happened at, uh, uh, with the pandemic, with, uh, with the COVID-19. So I believe that the sense of fragility that we all share, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it's, it's producing an amazing acceleration in how we are imagining the future of our of our cities. Uh, it's not about, uh, let's say, uh, drastically changing the trends, but it's more about accelerating some process, accelerating some expectation. And uh, I think that uh, if we, we try to, let's say, to talk about sustainable city, uh, now we have to, to uh, be aware, to be conscious that this means uh, imagining a city where everybody could, uh, let's say, uh, have at disposal uh, all the utilities necessary for the uh, daily life uh, in, a, in a, let's say, in a space and in a time has to be, uh, let's say, affordable for everybody. So there is this, let's say, rhetoric, but also very important message about 20 minute city, which is so successful and popular, but I think it's uh, absolutely uh, relevant and significant to talk about that. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, the relation between the two spheres, the three spheres that were conditioning the evolution of the modern city, not only in Europe, so uh, the residential sphere, uh, the sphere of uh, our, uh, let's say, work activity and the sphere of the, of the leisure uh, have to be completely redefined and uh, 
uh, the separation between these three is now uh, over in a way. So uh, the rigidity of the separation uh, is uh, something that we have seen how we can probably win in order to make a, a, a kind of osmotic relation between the three. So the city of the future will probably see this uh, osmosis. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and then uh, there is something with, related with our constant of nature, which is also extremely important because I think we have done our best as architect and urban planner in the past to, to push nature outside our bodies, outside our buildings, outside our cities, to consider nature as something that was extremely external. Uh, and probably the, the evidence of uh, the presence of the microorganisms in our body has, let's say, <laughs> in suddenly changed our feeling about our relation with nature. And, and this is a, such an important uh, change, and uh, also from a psychological point of view. And this explains a little bit also our, our need, our expectation for a different relation with living nature, like this idea of, um, also, let's say, a better proximity with uh, living nature. So that's uh, another, another uh, let's say, component of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of an idea of what the city should become in the next future. Yes, well, as a, as a father of two children who are growing up in a city, I can totally relate. Um, and in, in, in sort of achieving these, these ideas and goals, what do you think, which strategies and solutions you have done and seen have worked best so far? Which can you recommend? Well, so far, I think it's uh, uh, just to go back to this uh, uh, about, about uh, uh, let's say nature and, and cities, uh, uh, for sure, uh, uh, forestation, urban forestation is, uh, is, uh, is one of the most, uh, let's say, uh, faster, cheaper and inclusive way to try to, to, to deal with climate change, to deal with global warming, basically. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, it's also quite evident how many, many cities and metropolis in the world are now putting urban forestation, urban forestry uh, one, as a, one of the priority of their agenda uh, of public policies. And I, I understand this is a, so I, I believe this is a, such an important issue because uh, uh, forest and woodlands and basically trees, when they planted in a, an urban environment, uh, they, let's say, intervene in the place where CO2 is, is producing the most. So it's a, it's a way really to, uh, to balance the production of CO2. At the same time, we know that plants and trees are absorbing the dust, the microparticular dust, uh, the urban pollution, the air pollution. Uh, they reduce drastically the heat, uh, the heating effect, uh, the Thailand effect in the city. So there are many, many advantages in having more trees and more forests and more woodlands in our cities. And, uh, this is such an important issue, such an important issue, because it's really uh, a process that could become extremely inclusive, so uh, extremely democratic in a way, and uh, uh, involving local communities uh, together with the stakeholder, together with the public administration. And uh, well, this is something that we started to, let's say, love uh, many years. We have, together with FAO, Food Record Organization, we have promoted uh, in Mantua uh, five years ago, the first forum on urban forestation. And, and uh, we are working so much also in that direction. So what you see here is a vertical forest, but vertical forest is only one of the way we have to, to work on urban forestation. Urban forestation means, uh, let's say, uh, green roofs, uh, means uh, to multiplicate uh, the surface park and gardens, and basically to substitute parking areas with, with plants and trees. Uh, so it make uh, the soil more permeable, more capable to, let's say, absorb water. So there are so many, many ways uh, that we have to, let's say, develop all together if we want to make our cities greener. Let's stick for a moment with the Bosco Verticale, the, the uh, vertical forests, because that's what you're famous for, um, having started with those in, in Milano. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit how you came upon the idea and how you developed it further? Well, uh, it's not easy to talk about the beginning reading of an idea. Uh, honestly, 
I, I, I don't know. I simply remember that uh, when I've been asked to, to imagine, uh, to develop, to, to design a, a high rise building in this part of Milano, I was in Dubai uh, with my students and uh, we were, uh, let's say, observing the explosion of this city where more than 200 uh, high rises buildings were all covered by glass, by glass panels. And so I remember well that this, let's say, evident uh, contradiction or paradox of a city in the, in the desert, in the desert where, where the, the buildings were covered by glass and that were mirroring heat uh, of the sunlight on the public ground. So I was extremely, as I say, uh, not concerned, but, uh, but by this uh, uh, contradiction. And so I, I, when I came back to Milano, I immediately started to, to try to translate a, a dream that I had since a long time. So to making uh, architecture and living nature, nature uh, uh, the combination of where, where living nature not to be simply decoration or, or an ornamental presence, but it's a basic component of our architecture. So I tried to translate this dream in a, in a, in a real uh, proposal for these two buildings. And uh, so, at that very moment, it started a discussion, a dialogue with, the, with our real estate developer, Mr. Heinz and Mr. Catella, and they uh, asked me to, let's say, to answer to a list of very, very serious technical questions uh, about the life of trees and the high-rise building. And then uh, after two months of research, uh, I came back and uh, and then they they decided to let's say accept my proposal and, and we started. So it was at the beginning they were skeptical for sure, and uh, but uh, finally we we did. It's a you see here is a prototype. It's a it's an experiment that uh, it's now so important also in terms of how we can study it as a case study in order to improve what you are doing, what other architects are doing in many other parts of the world. Absolutely. Um... You know, when I when I see these pictures, um, especially from the high rises in Milan, um, I, I keep wondering, how is it? How is the experience of living there? After all, people have been living there now for, I believe, five years. Um, and um, uh, what's the first uh, sort of performance record? How is it living there? Well, I, you know, we have rented a, a very small apartment <laughs> in the vertical <laughs> Also, because you know that the direct experience is so important. So the direct feeling of always living there. Uh, and the answer is it's amazing because you, you feel yourself part of an ecosystem. Uh, so imagine that here we have 21,000 plants and uh, uh, more or less uh, 335 humans, uh, more than 20 species of birds that are nesting. And uh, when you are inside, you really feel you're still part of this ecosystem. And uh, it's also a very, very simple perception connected with the fact that when you watch to the, to the skyline, uh, the skyline is filtered by the leaves of the trees, of the shrubs, of the plants, maybe it has the roots uh, two, three floors below you. So it's uh, really amazing. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we have been in this building in 2014, October, so basically seven years ago, but the first plants, started to be moved from the botanic nursery where we started to, let's say, to uh, teach the plants to grow in the right way to the construction site uh, uh, nine years ago. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a living building and it's there since nine years. And uh, so we had the time to study, to study very well how plants are reacting, how humans are reacting. So uh, it's interesting how the ecosystem in itself is changing always in relation with uh, with the with the change the dimension of the plants, but also in relation with the sunlight, in relation with the change of the climate condition of the seasons. Changes also from in, in a very uh, let's say aesthetic way in terms of chromatic uh, variation. Uh, but but at the same time, it's going to be more stable. Stable. So it's this process of stabilization is so interesting uh, and and amazing and in a way totally unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do I, as a tenant uh, or as somebody who owns an apartment like this, have to put a lot of work into this? Uh, you mean as a tenant? Yes. Uh, no, no. So uh, we, we, what we have decided to do, if you are talking about the maintenance of, of plants, 
is that we have decided to to propose a, a totally centralized maintenance of mm -hmm. tree plants and uh -huh. shrubs, and and uh, we did it for many reasons. One is about the cost of maintenance, so we really engineering was much better, and that was absolutely right to to have a centralized maintenance in order to cut the cost. And at the same time, I think that is also from a conceptual point of view very important to. Uh, to underline the fact that all what is uh, living nature is a kind of common good for everybody. So it's also a way to, to, to let's say, to um, transmit the concept of respect to our plants and to our, to our this, uh, let's say, individuals, because uh, trees are individuals, plants are individuals. So uh, I think this is so great. And uh, that's the reason of that we are repeating this kind of uh, protocol uh, uh, in uh, all the other vertical forests that we are designing and building in different parts of the world. Mm. I, I have read about um, um, Bosco Verticale buildings in China, where people are actually also supposed to grow their vegetables in the house. Um, so, so, so are there different concepts? Are there different levels of the involvement of the tenants? I think it's so possible. So I'm not against that. I think also here there are, if you are a tenant, you can introduce some, let's say, small uh, plants. Uh, um, it's, well, the point is, it's a, it's a principle. So I think I'm totally in a favor of this idea of a centralized maintenance, and I told you why. But uh, well, why not? Mm. It depends. I think it's a, you know. Uh, this is a biological facade. So what you see here is not a, I, I repeat the decoration, but it's basically what we believe a city and architecture should become. So for us, it's very important that the decision about the position of the plants or the trees has to be, let's say, uh, developed uh, following some very clear criteria connected with the kind of humidity, the different uh, imperator that you find at different heights and also is a relation with the sunlight. For instance, uh, in the selection of the plants that we always do, we are considering how in the, the northern facade, the, the sunlight in the winter time is, let's say, uh, is, is much weaker. And so, uh, for instance, normally what we do in some part of the world is to have trees that are losing the leaves in, in, mm -hmm. in, in winter mm -hmm. in order to help the sunlight to enter in better. So we follow some, some let's say, uh, technical as, as possible scientific criteria in order to, to distribute the plants the best way, the better way. And, and uh, that's the reason we believe that it's important to not only have a man, uh, centralized maintenance, but also that the design of the facade and the location of the trees has to be, let's say, conceived by us together with, the, with our botanist uh, at the moment of the uh, construction and the process of construction. So normally we start considering the climate condition first. Then uh, after that, we start to do a selection of species that can better be adapted to that specific climate condition. And only at that very moment, we start to design the facade of the building. Let's say considering the expectation and the needs of every species of trees and plants. So in a way, if you see what we do in other, in other, in other parts of the world, uh, basically the space between the balconies or the space between the lodge and the balcony, this void is where the trees could, uh, let's say, grow and uh, extend its branch. So we study the evolution trajectory of every plants, and in reason of that, we create uh, the design of the facade. So for this reason, we are used to say we design um, yeah. house for trees inhabited by humans, but we designed mm -hmm. it. Uh, obviously, to, to do this right, you need a lot of knowledge. Architectures, uh, architects have to be environmentalists, environmentalists these days, in a way. Um, is there a danger that, that this approach is copied by, by amateurs and, and that it turns into all kinds of undergrowing and overgrowing disasters? Well, sure, but this is a danger we have always. So. Uh, I think it's uh, it's very important to to let's say try to follow some very serious technical uh, let's say question criteria. We only used to to work with uh, with botanists, uh, with people that know so well 
uh, uh, the life of trees, uh, the evolution trajectory of plants. Uh, and uh, uh, just to, to give you an example, the, how we study the system of irrigation of plants is so important. So we have worked a lot on that field. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, extremely important to study how trees are capable to resist to, uh, to the wind, to extreme windy conditions, to the lateral push of, uh, of, of wind. And, uh, and that's something that we have studied. Uh, we are normally used to, to check uh, uh, all the typologies of greenhouse that we have in a, in a gallery of wind, just to, to see how it reacts. To what our our typology. So there are. It's a very serious work. It's not something that you can do. Well, uh, just uh, just uh, let's say putting together uh, trees and 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 building in a, in a superficial way. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the selection of plants is also very important because we have to deal with allergy, for instance. So we normally ah. try to avoid to use. I don't know. Betula, that's the plant that I love, but uh, it's uh, one of the most rare plants, so produce allergies, so we avoid that. And then uh, it's uh, it's all about also insects and how we can imagine to have a, a biological fight against acars that are the enemies of plants. So there are so many uh, very very important uh, technical issues that we that everybody who wants to work on the combination of living nature and architecture should know. Uh, this is, for instance, a, a building we just finished built in, in Antwerp, in, in Belgium, where we are working on the roofs, on green roofs, and all these green roofs are uh, uh, commonplace, so are, um, let's say, owned by all the tenants, uh, all the uh, tenants of, the, of, the, of this house. Uh, but uh, we try always to, let's say, respect this uh, um, technical uh, uh, issues and at the same time to go ahead experimenting new solution. And this is one. Another thing that uh, I think for us is very important is what we have done in Eindhoven in Holland, uh, where we have just uh, in a, a, a vertical forest in social housing. And this is for us uh, it's such an important step forward because uh, from the from, uh, beginning of the vertical forest concept, we work it so much in order to make this typology affordable for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we are very, very happy of, and proud of this because this is a, a 75 meter uh, uh, vertical forest with uh, more than 130 apartment lots, uh, rental residential loft for, for students and young couples. And it's there, it's uh, fantastic. And we are very happy of that. Mm -hmm. um New York is thinking about um, forbidding uh, uh, high rises uh, that are mostly is sort of on the outside made out of glass. Um, do you think um, this is the way into the future, not having um, sort of these these pure glass high rises anymore, but really um, have um, your type of high rise all over? Oh, when I was teaching in uh, GSD Harvard uh, some years ago, I remember there was a an issue of the Arthur magazine who was saying that basically 95% uh, of the RS building were, that were in, in, in production and construction all over the world were covered by glass. Uh, glass is an amazing material, uh, but at the same time, we know that uh, uh, we, we, we have probably to introduce other material in the construction. And this is not only about the facades because uh, for instance, we are working very seriously in, the, in several uh, vertical forests that we are designing in order to introduce wooden uh, structure and timbers in, uh, in, in our buildings. And this is an amazing way to uh, drastically cut the production of CO2 during the construction process, not only after. So, uh, for instance, wooden slabs are conserving uh, CO2 inside uh, their structure. And uh, at the same time, they help to reduce the production of CO2 in the process of construction. So this is another uh, very important uh, direction of, uh, of what we have to do and of what we do also mm -hmm. when we have to ask it to design new vertical forest. There is um, uh, an initiative um, also supported by the EU that's called the New European Bauhaus, 
which which aims to really substitute um, uh, concrete by wood and also glass in a way. Um, uh, do you do you think there there's a lot of merit to this initiative? Is oh, no, I, I thought I have such a world. I'm totally in favor, and uh, I'm also let's say contributing to that uh, initiative. I I totally in favor of that. So uh, there are many reasons to do that. Another reason we we are quite developed. So we are now involved in the, the reconstruction of some uh, historical villages in central Italy after the earthquake, uh, 2016 earthquake, and uh, and uh, and we know well that uh, how how wooden structure are uh, are, uh, are anti seismic, are capable to let's say to to make the building. Uh, resistant to 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 earthquakes, and uh, so that's another good reason in some part of Europe to intensify uh, the number of buildings where and share building structure. So, uh, more in general, I think it's a, it's a, such a good initiative. We have uh, basically time for one more question. Um, I know you you have a lot of demand in China where you build not single high rises but even parts of cities um, but um, what on a global scale and also on a european scale has to be done also by lawmakers in order to make this transformation and your life easier it's a really good question so if uh, you see here for instance uh, the idea of uh, connecting uh, uh, Natural parks, oasis, uh, uh, in uh, in southern Europe, uh, it's a it's a way to go ahead with this uh, Richard Weller idea of a world park, where the area of the world, the region of the world, where you have the most uh, intense biodiversity, if connected together, can multiplicate their advantages. They can multiplicate their, their contribution to to absorb CO2, to um, let's say multiplicate biodiversity of living species and so on. So uh, that's something that I think we have to do. And uh, uh, just two years ago in, uh, in New York at the Climate Change Forum, so was the last uh, worldwide event before Glasgow, uh, we had been asked to work on that in order to, to show how it was possible to, let's say, transform this concept in a, in a, in a series of uh, regional actions. And we have worked so much also studying what is happening in uh, Central Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, this amazing uh, green grid wall that is now crossing basically the entire continent from uh, Senegal to Ethiopia. And uh, uh, that's, that's an example of what is possible to do. And uh, I think we have to work on that. So it's not only about uh, designing green building or making green roofs, uh, it's about uh, how we can make our cities greener and uh, to, to, to uh, make the cities in condition to act not as obstacles, but as possible hubs of these green uh, corridors, of these uh, green corridors of biodiversity that should become one of the most important uh, goals of, uh, of, of, the, of the nation, of the world in the future. So, that's the reason that urban forestation is so important. So you see here what we are doing in Milano, where we are planning to plant three millions of trees in the next future. But it is also connected with the idea to create this uh, regional uh, uh, corridor, uh, green corridor that could connect uh, an environment where biodiversity is, is so strong. Wonderful, Senor Boeri, it has been a great pleasure to, to yeah. talk to an architect who is really um, a transformative thinker at large, obviously, and thinks way ahead um, of what we have right now, but also way beyond a single building. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you so much. You're very kind. Thank you for your question. All right. Bye-bye.